Welcome to the IRS Solution Attorney Show. If you have problems with the IRS, don't focus on the negative, focus on the solutions. With the IRS Solution Attorney, Darren T. Mish. For over 15 years, he's been helping taxpayers with IRS problems reclaim their lives and their financial stability. Now, here's your host of the IRS Solution Attorney Show, Darren T. Mish. Welcome, welcome, welcome. This is the IRS Solution Attorney, Darren T. Mish. I'm here today again with my lovely and talented co-host, Katrina Madewell. How are you doing, Katrina? That would be me, doing fabulous. How are you? I'm doing really, really well today. So what's shaking up over there in Mishland? <laughs> well, you know... What do we got lined up for today? We're going to be talking today about the differences between tax evasion and tax avoidance because I get a lot of questions about this. I mean, everybody is, everybody knows that there's a negative connotation to tax evasion. I think that's pretty common knowledge. Yes. But I don't think people really understand what it means. So we're going to try and talk about that a little bit today. And we're going to mix things up a little bit more than, than usual here on the show today. Sounds like fun. I'm in it. Let's do it. So what is the difference between tax avoidance and tax evasion? Like, how do you explain that? Well, gee, I'm just really glad that you asked that. <laughs> so tax evasion is when you use illegal means to avoid the payment of taxes. So it means, uh, well, the best example that yeah, I can I think say, of. Yeah, break it down. Tell yeah, a story. The best example that I can think of is Al Capone, right? I mean, the, mo- the FBI didn't bring down Al Capone because uh, based on his mob, alleged mob or mafia activities, they actually brought him down because he failed to report his illegal income on his income tax returns, and that was tax evasion. He was evading, just means escaping, right? Or, or Running away from yeah, your obligation, your right? Your obligation to pay your income taxes. So that's really probably the best example that I can think of is, you know, technically even drug dealers are supposed to. So they're tax evaders. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, I, what, so what about all these things? We used, used to see it a lot more like in the 80s and 90s, but here I'm dating myself. Right, wait, wait, we see it in 2000s, a little bit less. But of course, anyway. you, were probably, you were probably in you know, uh, kindergarten in the I 80s. I was, yeah. I got a good memory. Anyway, <laughs> we, uh, they were like the infomercials that you would see all the time, like, don't pay taxes, it's not constitutional. You know what I'm talking about? Oh, I don't boy. I can't even know some of the names. We're you about probably yeah, know yeah. Them. we're gonna about we're about to blow up the phone lines at seven two seven four four one three thousand. Yeah, again, seven two seven four four one three thousand. If you got those IRS tax questions, call us again. Go ahead and call us. Even if you're one of these constitutional uh, free thinker folks, it'll be fun to just chat briefly about your beliefs that the uh, income tax is unconstitutional. Seven two seven four four one three thousand. Exactly. Seven two seven four four one three thousand. So it used to be really big around this area, the Tampa Bay area, actually, the, uh, these folks that, and, I, and I, I actually can identify with them. I, I think we're, we're on the same side. We just go about it differently, right? So there's people out there that believe that they shouldn't have to pay income taxes, and I'm kind of with them. Like philosophically, politically, I, I, I'm kind of with them. Yeah, can't we do this a different way? <laughs> R- right, or a little more fair way or, or more effective, more just but uh, there's folks that believe that the Constitution or, you know, outlaws the payment of income tax. There's some folks that believe that the, uh, the constitutional amendment that passed the income tax law was not properly ratified, and, and they go to kind of down that rabbit hole. Yeah, those are the ones that I've seen, like the infomercials that say it's not it, constitutional. And there was a number of these guys in the Tampa Bay area, uh, specifically down towards Sarasota, that were promoting these schemes uh, pretty heavily. And that leads me to the second example that just comes to mind about tax evasion, and that's Wesley Snipes, right? I mean, Wesley Snipes gets popped because he he follows the philosophies and advice of a guy named Eddie, Eddie Kahn, K-A-H-N, who uh, was promoting these schemes. And uh, Eddie Kahn, I believe, is still in prison for the promotion of these, you know, tax evasion schemes for lack of a better term craziness you know wesley snipes i forget how long he did but he did a fair amount of time he's out now i believe but um i think he did people like here. me like don't even watch the news that much <laughs> You're like, yeah wesley snipes yeah he's an actor he was in jail tax evasion oh yeah i think i heard something about that on twitter 
Which, by the way, if you have any uh, questions, you can hit us up on Darren's Twitter feed at Darren, D-A-R-R-I-N underscore Mish, M-I-S-H. Or you can call us at 727-441-3000. We'll be happy to answer your questions. So Snipes ended up doing uh, three years in prison for willful failure to file income tax returns, which is a little bit different than tax evasion. Tax evasion carries a sentence um, that's a little bit more stiff than that. But Mr. Khan, the uh, promoter of this scheme, ended up doing um, uh, 10 years in prison. So he's still there, as far as I know. The, one of the things that's really interesting about the Wesley Snipes case is that it was actually tried in Tampa because Mr. Khan was from roughly this area, and so the jurisdiction of the federal court that prosecuted Mr. Snipes was here in Tampa as well. So we were able to watch that case very closely. The reason that uh, the IRS actually uh, prosecutes high visibility people is because our system is based on what's called voluntary compliance. And the tax protesters really seize upon this phrase, voluntary compliance. Well, right. if it's called voluntary compliance, isn't, doesn't that mean that the payment and filing of tax returns is voluntary? Well, not sort exactly, of. kind of. <laughs> what it means, what voluntary compliance means is that we voluntarily comply with the law file tax returns, self-assess. We actually get to calculate what our tax is ourselves. There's something of an honor system going on there. I mean, it, Unless you get an audit, right? <laughs> right, and we'll talk about that <laughs> later. But, you know, by and large, you prepare or have somebody prepare your tax return and you calculate the tax that's appropriate and then you file it with the, with the, with the government. In lots of other countries, there, there isn't self-assessment. The government calculates it, tells you what your bill is, and... So they kind of look at your bank statements, I would imagine, or something like that, and assess what you owe, or uh, factor it off your income, or something like that? Yeah, I think in these other countries, it's probably more of an automatic kind of withholding from your pay. I don't know what they do with businesses, honestly. And then a lot of ta uh, countries... Uh, that have, might be why we have more of tax issues here, the free enterprise kind of system. It could right? be. I mean, we're one of, obviously one of the most capitalistic, you know, enterprising industrious sort of societies on earth still right. despite all the changes that have come about in the last decade or so hey echo welcome to the show hello how are you doing good how are you i'm doing good what can we answer for you today I should say what can darren answer for you today how you doing echo i'm good how are you good 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 what's up what's up well i wanted to see actually um i was in the business, the mortgage business, for a long time, up until 2007, and then I had taken a break for a little bit, for about three or four years, and started working back for Katrina the last couple of years. Between that time, I had some issues to where I wasn't filing my return, so I wanted to see if I could get some help from you on that. It's about four years that I have to try to work on. Sure, sure. Let's talk about this just briefly for the benefit of our audience, okay? So you stopped filing in maybe 2007 and maybe 2007, 8, 9, and 10? Is that? Correct. Okay. So I've got some good news for you. Are you ready for some good news? Yes, please. All right. So <laughs> Everybody the, say good news. The good news is, is that the, the statute of limitations for the crime of failure to file a tax return. So when we were talking about Mr. Snipes going to jail for failing to file a tax return, that might have alarmed you a little bit. But don't worry. Most people by far, who fail to file, are not criminally prosecuted because the government, frankly, doesn't have the assets to prosecute us all. So when Wesley Snipes or a judge or a lawyer or a doctor or somebody, some high-profile person in the community doesn't file and they get a hold of that, then they prosecute that person, they make an example, and then it ends up in the media. We all hear about it. We get scared. And then the, I was going to the, say, they want to make an example out of that person. Right. So the idea is that we, we will then file if we haven't filed. You know, we'll, we'll do the right thing. So my good news for you, Echo, is that you know, the, the, the statute of limitations for the crime of failure to file is only six years, okay? So what that means in clear, simple terms is beyond six years, you actually don't have to file that tax return. So instead of having to do 07, 08, 09, and 10, you're only going to have to do 9 and 10. So okay. that might cut down on your burden quite a bit. And it might actually, frankly, honestly, cut down on how much you might owe, too. Now, okay, great. Now, there some, are some exceptions to, the, to these rules, okay? So I can't say that categorically that's the situation for you, but I can say that that's the situation 99.9% .9 of the time. So I think that's probably pretty good news for you. And Echo, if you want to uh, contact the office, probably the best way to do that is to go to my website at getirshelp.com, and uh, the phone number's there, and you can call, and I'd, be, I'd love to talk to you. 
Uh, that would be great. Yes, I would love to make an appointment to see you soon. Fantastic. Is there anything else I can do for you? Nope, that would be it. Where Thank does somebody so like much. that start, Darren? What would they need to bring to your office once they have an appointment? Well, here's they the, start with a consultation. Yeah, or? The, what we do is we set up an appointment. We do a very short sort of intake process where we ask some questions to make sure it's a good fit, so that you know we're not wasting your time and you're not wasting our time. But after that, we'll set up an appointment. And typically, if the person's local, I really recommend they come into the office because the dynamic of me sitting here with you in person is different than if we're just talking over the phone. Like I can't read Echo's body language and there's, I'm missing some information. She's told me that verbally over the air here, but the, the relationship's a little bit different. Can't so we, see her eyes, the body gestures. Right, so I'm trying, I'd like to meet her so that I can really understand what she needs so that I can help her more adequately. But honestly, over half of my consultations are over the phone because I represent clients all over the country. So if they just can't come in, then we're gonna, Go ahead and do it over the phone. Perfect. So get irshelp.com if you have any questions, and you can connect with Darren's team. Okay, Echo, is there anything else we can do for you? Nope, that would be it. Thank you so much. You guys have a good show. Thanks. Oh, thanks for calling. Take care. So I wanted to say one more thing about what we would do in a a situation like that, because many, many people, especially, well, many, many many people, if they haven't filed tax returns, are going to have a real problem with coming up with their W-2s and 1099s in that situation. Because let's face it, I mean, she's talking about filing 09 Seven, and 10. Seven, eight years ago. Yeah, this is a ways back now. So what we do is we get a power of attorney, uh, which allows us to communicate with the IRS on her behalf and represent her. And then we will very discreetly, electronically request those missing what we call wage and income statements. It's essentially the W-2s, the 1099s, and the 1098s. And at least we'll can have see the, what was reported by the employer. Exactly. At least then we'll have the income information. And in the case of the W-2, we'll have the taxes withheld, and we can prepare a return from there. So that's how we do it. You make it so much less scary. Well, that's what I'm here for, you know. I mean, that's a scary topic. And uh, I actually like the fact that it's a scary topic. It keeps uh, lots of other attorneys and accountants and stuff out of the practice of helping people with tax problems. But, you know, I believe firmly that every single problem in life has some sort of solution. Now, some solutions are really painful and hard, of but every solu- every problem has a solution. And But the faster you get through it, the faster you can move in another direction. It, exactly. You know, I've met people, and I think I've shared uh, with this, this with you on the air before. I've had people come in that haven't filed since 1960, and they're, you know, physically <laughs> trembling. So they're, crazy. It, the, the, the fear of this problem has literally ruined the better part of their lives. And I, my heart really goes out to those people. I mean, come on. Like, ha- life is hard enough without going to sleep every night wondering if you're going to get arrested for failure to file tax returns when you're really kind of not a high wage you know kind of person and it's just really i I can't imagine the stress that they must feel you know yeah it's just i know for me like one of the biggest stressors i ever had was you know having debt and that was enough and you compile irs debt on top of that and i can see why some of these people wouldn't sleep you know i've owed the irs money a couple times you know my life and my career and uh it's funny, you know, I can open up an IRS letter for a client, no big deal. I mean, I'm totally objective. It doesn't make my heart race or anything like that. But when that letter is addressed to you with your name on it, that's never a good thing. It's never. Kind of like the lawsuits we talked about before yeah. the show. Yeah, never a happy time. So anyway, back on track, what we were talking about with tax avoidance versus tax evasion. So tax avoidance, do you, like, what are some examples that... Like, what could you talk about instead of just flat out evading, running from not filing the taxes? How can some people actually legally avoid taxes? Do you get into much of that or talk about that? Yeah, you know, tax avoidance is completely legal. And there's a famous quote by Judge Learned Hand. I'm going to see if I can find it here. He says, anyone may, may arrange his affairs so that his taxes shall be as low as possible. He is not bound to choose that pattern which best pays the treasury. There's not even a patriotic duty to increase one's taxes. I'm going to put it in a parenthesis, despite what some people in politics think. Who Adding don't, value to the sentence. <laughs> over and over again, the courts have said that there's nothing sinister in so arranging affairs as to keep taxes as low as possible. Everyone does it, rich and poor alike, and all do right, for nobody owes any public duty to pay more than the law demands. So that's a big, fancy, sort of antiquated way of saying if you can arrange your affairs legally, appropriately, such that you pay less tax, they're all for it. Okay? So examples, we have some really clear and obvious examples just in regular everyday life. Why do people buy houses, by and large? 
Well, for the most part, for the uh, interest deduction, although the rates are so low right now, it's, you know, Which I think the home ownership pride is a bigger factor. I think maybe right now, but, you know, for years and years, one of the biggest reasons why people bought a home instead of renting was so they could kind of, they'd get that home interest deduction, they'd be able to write that off and itemize it on Schedule A, and it would help kind of shield some of their income. You know, Darren, when I started in this business, conventional money, which is, you know, if you have good credit, it's the rates that those people get. 12%. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the balloons were popping that were originated in the 80s. And I think that's still part of the reason why, you know, going to private money for a jumbo loan or something might still make sense to some people because, hey, you know, we're, the interest in part is a write off and it's kind of helping. So I think with interest rates as low as they are, too, I think that it should be encouraging the purchase of bigger and bigger homes, which right. is kind of funny because. The government well, the buying powers more. Yeah, and the government kind of talks out of both sides of their mouth, right? I mean, <laughs> you know, they don't want you to buy more house than you can afford, but then the tax structure, like like many times, the tax structure sometimes encourages behavior that the government doesn't necessarily want to encourage. And it's because politicians don't always think through their Right. They're, you know, what they're trying to accomplish when they pass legislation. You know? I think you had HSA on your list, which is a hot topic to talk about, too. And for me, this was pretty new. Even for me, somebody that I consider pretty educated within the last couple of years just started doing this because I'm like, I'm not sure where to start. Like, yeah, health savings accounts are really, really cool. Um, I have I have one and I've had one for years. Basically, a health savings account is what needs to happen in our society, not Obamacare. Health savings accounts really are the answer to the problem, this health care crisis, in air quotes, that we, that we have right now. That's and what the, Ben Carson's pushing, not to. Exactly. You know. and, and the reason why I believe it's the answer is because it's just so elegant the way it works. What you do is you buy a high, uh, a high deductible insurance policy. I think for my family of four, it's about $400 a month, which is pretty affordable. Yeah. And I think the deductible, I can't remember. I want to say it's around $10,000. And then uh, I can put maybe... Six thousand or seven thousand dollars. I I think it's sixty two fifty right now. Uh, you can put sixty two fifty a year into your health savings account pre tax. So depends on the size of the family too, doesn't it? Does, it? it does. Okay. I'm just giving a, a concrete right. example in my situation, and so I can spend that sixty two fifty a year on any health related expenditure that I want, you, even over over the counter medication, prescription medication, dental, vision. Yeah. You know, well, wellness. You know, wellness visits are free now, but you know, doctors, copays, all that stuff. We just went through that with Invisalign. We like maxed that up when we knew our daughter was going to get braces. And th that money, if you go ahead and, and max that out every year, that money can roll over into that health savings account from year to year. And if you still have it there at age sixty-five, it turns into an IRA automatically. I mean, this is really a cool and elegant solution. That's and here's, cool. Here's I think one, the one we have is different, but that's neat. And here's here's one thing that really works to help drive down healthcare costs, and that is people don't realize this. And here's some value today on the show, really. People don't realize this. You can actually bargain with the doctor. So the doctor has multiple price schedules, and nobody ever talks to the doctor really about prices, and the doctor, frankly, doesn't have any idea what he charges for anything. No, and they don't want to talk about it. That's, their negotiating skills are not their strong points. <laughs> right, so you go medicine. and you talk to the, to the office manager or whatever, and if you go and say, can you just tell me what the cash price is for this procedure or situation that I'm in, and they will normally knock sometimes as much as two-thirds off the HMO price Wow. for you to pay right then and there with your HMA, HSA debit card. And uh, that's how you know our healthcare system is just jacked up. And, and the reason that they have to charge so much is because they know their bill is going to get cut in half by the insurance company. And then there's all these complicated paperwork and whatnot. It might take, in fact, my, one of my kids' uh, uh, obstetricians didn't, it took over a year for her to get paid after the birth of my child. So, I mean, think about that. That's crazy, right? I have a funny story, kind of a cool Sounds story. Sounds like real estate. Sometimes that's how long we wait to get paid, too. <laughs> it's just how it works. I got a cool story about. Um, prepaying on the HSA. So when one of my children was being born, uh, we were in the, the delivery room and they had just told us that there was going to have to be a C-section. And so we were kind of stressed and upset and nervous about that. Phone rings. The phone rings, somebody else answers it and they say, Mr. Mish, the phone's for you. I'm like, what? <laughs> I'm not having the baby here. So I pick up the phone and it's the hospital's business office. And they basically say, Mr. Mish, we understand that your insurance doesn't cover this, you know, the, the pregnancy delivery. We, but we want you to know that the normal price is $13,000. And I said, okay, all right. It seems like a lot, but all right. Uh, somehow I'll be able to swing that. And they said, but if you full pay, 
before you leave the hospital, we'll knock it in half to 6,500 bucks. Wow. So, I mean, that was one of the clues about, hey, this is all negotiable. And I did somehow come up with $6,500 before we left the hospital because, I mean, that's 50% off. That seemed like a really great deal to me. When you think so, about it, their chances of collecting that money is much greater if they collect it before you actually get the services performed than after it's done. Yeah, and think about how much administrative cost they've saved because they didn't have to, to chase anything. multiple bill for a year or more. The last sort of idea that I can, example I can come up with for a legal tax avoidance strategy is the second home deduction. You know, I just bought an RV uh, several months ago. And in part because it's technically a second home. My understanding of the tax law for second home is the vehicle has to have a galley and a head. So it has to have a kitchen and a, and a bathroom. And so it applies to boats. It applies to RVs. Uh, it applies to houses, obviously. I still want the tax code. I'm giving that one to my accountant. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, in part, I purchased an RV because I knew that over half the payment, I was going to be able to deduct as home interest. So... That sounds a little bit uh, sketchy. I don't even mean sketchy, but it well, sounds... Well, I mean, it's a matter of, do you know the rules, really, is what you're talking about. Exactly. And so we just go back to Learn Enhanced Quote. He says, hey, you have no obligation to pay more tax than you have to pay. If the laws are on the books, it's, it's up it. to you. Yeah, use it to your advantage. It's up to you to use your advantage, for sure. So that's, a, that's the best example I can think of for... Uh, tax avoidance strategies. And I, we want to let you guys twice. know also we're live today in the studio so you can call in with your IRS tax questions and also you can hit us up on Twitter. So our studio call in lines are 727-441-3000. Again, studio call in lines to ask Mr. Darren Mish your IRS tax questions is 727-441-3000. And you can also hit us up on Twitter at Darren underscore Mish. That's D-A-R-R-I-N underscore mish m-i-s-h i think it's time for a break katrina i think we've got a minute left okay why don't you go ahead and answer this uh twitter question that we had real quick oh fred asks um what is tax evasion well we kind of already covered that right i mean it's the using of illegal means to avoid the payment of tax and the best example that you can think of if you're just kind of thinking about it is drug dealers you know drug dealers have illegal income they're very hesitant to Report that income to the government, and they're very, very hesitant to go ahead and pay tax on it. So, And Rick in Titusville, he wants to know what are the penalties for cheating on your taxes? I think that's a great teaser, and I think we can talk about that after the break. Sounds like a plan. You're listening to the IRS Attorney Solution Show. I'm your co-host, Katrina Madewell. And I'm the IRS Solution Attorney, Darren Mish. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be back in a minute. In the meantime, stick around. We're going to answer some more of your questions on Twitter. Feel free to call in. 727-441-3000. 727-441-3000. We'll be back in a minute. Are you suffering from IRS problems? Do you owe back taxes you can't pay? Is your paycheck or bank account being levied? Or maybe you haven't filed tax returns in years and simply don't know what to do. This is Darren T. Mish to tell you that if you're tired of IRS problems hanging over your head and are ready for a fresh start, we may be able to help. Call the law offices of Darren T. Mish at 888-GET-MISH, 888-G-E-T-M-I-S-H. I can help you file old tax returns, work to release tax liens or stop wage levies, even negotiate deals to pay off back taxes at a discount, sometimes for pennies on the dollar. Hey, let's face it, these days it's not hard to get into tax trouble. A divorce, failed business, health problems, you name it. The point is, IRS problems may be solved if you're willing to take the first step. Call for a free consultation at 888-GET-MISH. That's 888-438-6474. Or go to the web at getirshelp.com. Because the one sure thing is, IRS problems don't solve themselves. So get MISH. 888-438-6474. Principal Office, Tampa. Welcome back to the show. If you missed any part of the show, we are going to put it together for you on a podcast at getirshelp.com. And we'll be here to also answer your questions. We're live in studio, 727-441-3000. Again, 727-441-3000. We left off talking about a question that we got from Rick in Titusville. He wanted to know what the penalties for cheating on your taxes are. Pretty interesting question, I think. Uh, I looked up some statistics on the over the break just because they're amazing. The... Um, the estimated number of people who cheat on their taxes each year. You want to take a guess? Oh, my gosh. The estimated number? 
I would, is it, can I give you a percentage? I would say 75% of the people that file. Okay, wow. You, you have a lot bigger guess of it than I did. It's 1.625 million people though. So one over, over, um, one, you know, over a million six hundred twenty-five thousand people a year are estimated to cheat on their taxes. Well, when I, you think about cheating, like, what does that mean to you? You know what I mean? So that can be a pretty vague question. That's why I said seventy-five percent. I, I think that's sort of interesting that you that you said that because there's degrees of cheating, right? Right. Well, uh, what's your definition of cheating? That's you know, what it is. There used to be. You know, this hasn't hasn't been that long ago. Perhaps ten years ago, you didn't have to have receipts for your charitable donations. Remember that. So it was just like whatever, whatever you self-reported. It's not like they fill them out anyway. Yeah, I think now churches and stuff are taking, you know, you write a check to your church now in part so that they can give you that statement at the end of the year to tell you how much you, you know, con- contributed or but tithe. But like other or donations, if you donate stuff outside of tithe. Yeah, that's really kind of an interesting point is that Goodwill or Salvation Army or those kinds of places will give you receipts now, but it's really important that you get an itemized receipt. So instead of having a receipt that says close, that's not going to work in an audit at all. It, the IRS is going to be like, okay, well, what what does close mean? And eh, you lose. We're going to disallow that deduction. So what you really need to have on there is, you know, one lady's jacket in fair condition, dash, 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 some fair price. And there's places you can look up the, the value of those kinds of things online. Back so in the it really days, should be that detailed? Yeah, I mean, if you're going to do it, if you're going to take that charitable donation for, you know, old clothes or a boat or anything that you donate like that, you're going to, you need some valuation. You need a pretty detailed receipt. But that doesn't really answer old Rick's question about what the penalties are. The penalties for tax evasion are up to five years in federal prison and a $500,000 fine. But that's evasion. That's for evasion. Like escaping, not like running from. So... Yeah, you're right. He didn't ask what the penalties for tax evasion were. He asked no. what the penalties were for cheating on your taxes. So, yes. all right, let me double circle so back and think about this. Question straight here. All right. So, I guess if you cheat again, we'll come back to degrees of cheating. Yeah. Right. So, like, is that taking a meal in the entertainment when it wasn't a meal in the entertainment, or what is cheating? You know? Yeah. So, I represent a lot of people who are going through audits, and that's really the penalty for cheating is that. If uh, there's that old saying, uh, pigs get fat and hogs get slaughtered. So a minor amount of cheating, quite frankly, I think many, many people get away with. But it's the hogs, the people who just go crazy on their tax return. And they're obviously, uh, what do we call that? Puffing up their deductions or, you know, diminishing their income. Well, they're blowing it up. I mean, it's way, so that gets back to my percentage as being real. So really, the numbers are technically probably higher. Oh, I think they probably are higher. But it depends, again, on the degree of cheating and what, right. what we're trying to measure here. But, but um, I love your analogy. That's perfect. Like pigs get fat, hogs get slaughtered. Yeah, exactly. You know, if you're trying to write off. I've seen everything. I've, I've, seen, uh, I've seen people write off virtually their entire lives. You know, they're their gross income from their business is 100000 and they wrote off, you know, 91000 And even though it keeps going up, it's all a tax write-off. Yeah, I mean, like their entire life is a tax write-off. I don't think that that's... Um, is there kind of like a general percentage that, they, that triggers an audit? I know it's different lines, but... There's something called a diff score. So the IRS assigns a diff score to pretty much every line on the tax return. And so they have parameters. And between these two parameters, that's sort of typical and acceptable. But if you get outside of those parameters on the diff score, and they don't publish what they are for obvious reasons, right? I mean, everybody That's would, fabulous. <laughs> the, you know. It's too bad somebody doesn't have that algorithm. They'd be like running their tax returns through that before they file it. Yeah, that'd be kind of like uh, learning how to uh, game Google or something. You I know? know, right? But uh, So anyway, the diff score. The diff score. If you fall outside of that diff score, then you're going to get an audit. And really, the audit is the penalty for cheating on your taxes. So they can audit. You. They, the rough rules are... They can audit up to three years in a normal situation. They can audit. They can go back up to six years if there's what's called a substantial understatement of income of 25% or more. So what does that mean? Like they're writing off way too much is not real or not reporting stuff or maybe it's actually all the above? not reporting income. Not okay. overstating deductions, but not reporting income, which is pretty common. You might not think about these examples, but, you know. Uh, so cash. If you got cash, you report a part of your income that was, re- you know, reported by someone else, but then... The rest was yeah, cash. Let's say you ran a convenience store and 80% of, of all transactions today are you know, credit using a credit. Debit. Right, exactly. Using plastic and say 20% in, are in cash. 
sometimes these business owners don't realize that the cash actually needs to get reported and they have to pay taxes on that. I'm being pretty nice here when I say they don't realize that. that. Right. And so when the IRS sees that the difference, you know, there's essentially no cash coming into this cash business. They know better. It doesn't make sense. Right. And they have audit guides for virtually every kind of business out there. And those, what's kind of cool about the audit guides is they're actually available to the public. You can type in, in in a Google search, you can type in IRS audit guide and then put in your profession or business and odds are it's going to come up. I mean, I uh, have used the IRS audit guide for attorneys quite a bit, not because I'm worried about being audited necessarily, but because I give it to other attorneys so that they know how to arrange their affairs so that they're not going to get audited. Now, do you represent tax payers that have had an audit uh, triggered and now they're going to be audited by the IRS? Is that something you do? I do handle some audits. I'll be honest. Audit representation is not my favorite thing in the world. And I'll tell you why. I'll be very frank about this. I always think like enrolled agent, like CPA. Yeah. The reason that audits aren't usually my favorite thing is because most people who get audited are a mess. I mean, that's why they got audited. (laughs) Everything's a mess. They got a shoebox full of receipts. If we're lucky, they have some receipts. And uh, and something bad is going to happen. I mean, there is going to be a significant, in most audits, there's going to be a significant addition of tax, assessment of tax. And they're going to be unhappy with whoever handles the audit. I mean, this is just a fact of life. They're not going to be happy because most people are not uh, completely realistic about what's going to happen after the audit. And so uh, I will handle some audits, but only if I think the paperwork and the and our chances of prevailing are really, really strong. I primarily handle people or represent people who after the audit. So there's big, right. big tax assessment. And so try, instead of trying to attack the math on the front end to argue that they owe less tax, we handle it as a collection case, basically, typically asserting that they just can't afford to pay. So walk me through an example of that. So they, you know, something happens, they got triggered or not it. The auditor came in there and they said, no way, no how, this is jacked up. You didn't report income. You didn't file. You didn't whatever. Let's say hypothetically speaking, they reported maybe 50,000, but they made what a hundred fifty. Would that be a real? Yeah. So in that case, in your scenario, that person might be assessed 50 or a hundred thousand dollars in extra tax penalties, interest. And typically you don't get audited for one year. You get up, you get audited for three years typically. So they're going to take whatever you would have owed based on their number, like however they're finding stuff and then tack on extra stuff. Yeah. Their philosophy is if they, if they run an audit and they find substantial problems, in that one tax year, well, then the odds are pretty good that for there's going to be problems in other years, right? I mean, right. So then they they expand it out to three years. Uh, many times they disallow virtually all of the dedu- uh, dedu- the deductions, deductions, those things, and uh, and then they assess the tax. And of course, now there's penalties for you know filing an inaccurate return, and then there's interest and you know and so on, and so it balloons out of control. So, it, what point does that become like? Because, I mean, I imagine if they don't have receipts and stuff and they didn't file, that probably easily goes into a collection, which... Yeah, yeah. because, you know, let's say it's a six-figure liability now and they don't have the money. And so I represent a lot of people who, I frankly, I, I, I'll i talk to them before the audit and I'll find out, well, do you actually have a strong income and assets? And if the answer is no, I say, well, then don't bother spending your money fighting the audit because you're not going to win there. It's not a good place to... To, to waste your money and resources fighting there let's think about at least letting the big taxes in you know the audit be assessed and we'll try and do an offer and compromise on the back end remember an offer and compromise is where you make a deal to settle for less it's based on the pack or, or what your technical ability or your hypothetical ability is to pay and so we, we prevail in a lot of cases post audit with offers and compromise i've actually successfully talked the irs out of an audit one time right in the middle of an offer and compromise where I mean, my guy was, he's broke and he had nothing. And we were just about to get the offer settled and an audit pops up and I called the auditor and I said, what are you doing wasting the resources of the government on a guy, you know, just so you're going to assess a hundred grand and then I'm going to wipe it out again. So what's <laughs> the point here? Blood from a turnip here. And I really didn't think it was going to be successful, but I, I got a, I got a letter a few days later. You're right. We Depends decided on who to close you get, right? And if you can talk some common sense into those IRS heads. Well, so seldomly can I just tell a story and make tax go away. You know, that just doesn't happen. I usually have to demonstrate, you know, things through documentation and paperwork and whatnot. But in that case, 
Common sense prevailed. That's a very uncommon situation with the government. I don't know. Maybe you could just get better at telling your story. <laughs> yeah, it could be. You never maybe, know. Maybe I should. So what's this craziness we're hearing in the news about IRS dropping these uh, bombshells on these small employers with Obamacare? There's so much stuff that I don't even know about it. Do you know anything about that? Yeah, I'm not going to be shy about this. I'm not a big fan of, of Obamacare. I don't uh, think I'm it makes either. sense. I don't like to share my political jump in. I wouldn't have picked it. Yeah, it's not my, my idea of a good idea, but... There is a regulation that the IRS has promulgated, okay? This is pretty interesting because it's not a statute. It's not in the Obamacare statute. This is purely made-up regulation that the IRS has decided to pass. And basically what the situation is, if a small employer of less than 50 employees helps their employees in any way with health insurance, so contributes to their health care, you know, if they basically have health care outside of the Obamacare exchange, the fine is $100 a day per employee. So this hasn't sunk in. So they in. can't even offer? They can't even, they can't help. They can't pay a percentage. They, they can't increase the employee's salary to help compensate or pay for the health insurance. The IRS's position on this is that the penalty should be $100 a day per employee. So let's think about this for a minute. You got three, uh, you've got, one employee, the penalty f technically for a year would be $36,500 in penalty if you pay $300 a month out of somebody's $400. So know. how is that any different from some, like, for example, my husband's, you know, government, he works for the city. And so the city obviously offers paid health insurance. And then, you know, you add the family, they pay their portion. It's because of the size of the employees. Is that what yeah, you're saying? Yeah, it's the size of the company. So the same type of thing in a small business, they're saying. Yeah, because, you know, the... The goal, I think, of the government is to get more and more people in these exchanges and gain more and more control over health care. Ugh. Makes me sick. And, and so, I mean, this, this situation is really a travesty. I don't, I don't see how this, you know. How can that even stand up? Like, how could that honestly, it doesn't have any merit. So it's pretty popular to say in the public that we it's hate. It's like saying I can't help one of my employees buy a car. I mean, you might as well. What's or, the difference? Right. Or anything, really. But it's really popular in public. Actually, in as a matter of fact, there's something called coercion when it comes to insurance and stuff. Mm -hmm. You know, like homeowners insurance from on the real estate side. So how is this any different? Well, really? government coercion is legal. Oh. I mean, it's been happening since the beginning of time, right? Well, so, that explains a lot. But it, it's really popular in our culture for people to say they they hate lawyers or dislike lawyers. And I'll, I'll tell you how this is going to change. Is some not me, but some very brave very smart lawyer is going to attack this regulation is going to win is going to get it thrown out or it's going to come to the attention of somebody in congress and they're going to pass a law fixing this now the challenge with congress is i can't seem to get anything done so it's probably going to come about through a lawsuit that's my best guess is that it'll get fixed that way some lawyer will take a case and, and we'll get it fixed probably some fresh out of law school ready to jump in and you know have I a strong know. attorney back in a month maybe i wouldn't want to take that that case fresh out of law school so there was another little story we saw about tax scam losing in excess of uh, of twenty million, but I don't hardly ever watch the news, so I don't even know much about that. Okay, so here's what's going on here in this story is that there are scammers, for lack of a better term, overseas who are calling taxpayers all over America at their home number and leaving a message something to the effect of my name and in my case they actually called my house which was pretty oh, this funny is fabulous scared the bejeebers out of my wife he leaves a message hi this is steve martin i'm not kidding he said my name is steve martin and i'm from the irs and something like and you must call me back at such and such number immediately uh we have filed a lawsuit against you but you can settle the lawsuit if you call back today or something along those lines <laughs> and um uh, I get clients pretty regularly that get these crazy voicemails. And if you call back the, the number, I presume that they then get as much personal information a, out of you as they can. Name, and then address, they, social, yeah. everything they need to steal your identity. Then they get a bank account number and or a debit card number or something along those lines and they clean you out. Now, I actually was home one day and I got one of those calls. And, and let me tell you, I had a good time. I called them back <laughs> over and over and over again. I felt like it was pretty neat because I couldn't get in trouble for harassing the guy who was trying to, you know, do the fishing scheme on me. That's fabulous. I love it. I love it. You're listening to the IRS Attorney Solution Show. When we come back after the break, we're going to do the train wreck of the week, right? 
Welcome back to the IRS Solution Attorney Show. I'm Darren Mish. I'm here with Katrina Madewell as co-host. Welcome back. Welcome, welcome. We'll be here same time, same place every week. Hopefully. Answering those IRS questions that you get. We had a lot of really good Twitter questions today. Yeah, don't be shy. You know, don't be shy about asking these questions. I mean, there's a lot of shame and anxiety sometimes wrapped up around this stuff. You know, you can always give us a call at 727-441-3000, 727-441-3000 if you have a, an IRS problem question. I don't really want to be asking tax planning questions. It's not really my thing. But if you haven't filed or if you owe more money to the IRS than you can afford to pay, then by all means, call in. You don't have to give us your real name. We can have a whole bunch of Freds. That's okay with me. Yeah, you could be Susie or Joe or Sam or whoever you want to be. Right. Hypothetical. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And uh, I like questions. All right, that's, that's time. The, the IRS train wreck of the week. This is a great story, guys, and it's a little bit different than the other train wrecks that I've been talking about lately. This particular gentleman I had represented over the years, and I, I helped him resolve a very large payroll tax problem, and, and that went away, and that's not what we're talking about here. He had a very good year, and he, he earned about, I don't know, five or $600,000. He paid the tax couple hundred thousand dollars and there was about sixty thousand dollars in penalties associated with his account ouch he that's gave, a nice car yeah pretty nice car right he, he called me and he asked if there was anything that i could do about it and there are a couple ways to abate penalties oh. abate means to eliminate so there are a couple ways to deal with penalties but there's a really cool thing called first time penalty abatement and first time penalty abatement is almost automatic and here's how it works if in the prior three years you had paid substantially no penalties, so if you didn't have any substantial penalty in the prior three years, you pretty much get a freebie. So he told me about the situation. I, I, I thought that he had been a pretty compliant taxpayer over the years. The payroll thing was a different issue altogether. Uh, I told him I thought I could do something for him. I did the research. I checked the prior three years. There was no penalty, you know, sure as day. I contacted the IRS. I asked them to eliminate the penalties. And they didn't even put up a fight. It was $60,197. So that was one very happy client that day. They got, you know, over 60 Whoa. grand written off. That's so cool that they really seriously wipe out that, like, freebie. Like, 60 grand, that's a lot of money for so, a tax penalty. you know, everyone out there, now that you know that this first-time penalty abatement exists, you need to save up. What I'm saying here is don't get these ticky-tacky penalties. You know, don't file one day late. You know, try and be compliant. And if you need this, then you need to take advantage of it. That's me. The ticky tacky penalties. Totally non-intentional. I see $200 penalties on people year after year. And it's kind of like, come it's not on. not that bad, but. You know, come on. Like, if you're going to if you're gonna do it wrong, do it way wrong. No, I didn't say that. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> so we got some cool stuff happening in and around Tampa in our neck of the woods. Yeah, you know, I realize that this has really nothing to do with IRS problems or, or taxes, but I just want to... It's all hyper-local, though, right? Just yeah, like radio. Yeah, I just wanted to talk about some cool stuff that's going on this weekend or, or this week coming up. And um, I came across this news story, and, uh, you know, 9-11's coming up again. And hopefully there's nothing, you know, no ter terrorist attacks or anything like that on 9-11. It seems like it's an anniversary for that nowadays. And it's really up to us as American citizens to just... Make it not be a negative holiday. Let's commemorate and, and remember, but let's not be afraid. And so there's something really cool happening over at NASA in Titusville, and I realize that's not in Tampa, and it's, it's a couple-hour drive. They're bringing down um, a couple steel beams from the, from the terrorist attack from the World Trade Center, and they're going to be putting those on display, and uh, they're going to have a nice ceremony. They brought them all the way down from New York City. They're going to be a very nice ceremony uh, unveiling those. And uh, well. you know, piece of history getting moved around there yeah uh, have you been to the um actually to the site up there in new york i have not it's uh i had not been there before they fell but i've been there since with the fountain and it's it gives you you know goosebumps i'm sure i you know i had um have some clients here that you know work for local law enforcement and they were retired nypd and it was crazy because right before he moved here he had pictures of him with the twin towers in the background and they actually asked him to stay a little bit longer when that happened and then he came down here it was just surreal you know i was born and raised in southern california and i was living in tampa at the time and i was shocked at how many people that i knew were actually in manhattan or in new jersey on that day and we talked about it later and they said yeah i was there and i saw him fall that's scary 
you know i mean i mean that's i remember watching it on the news still i mean my oldest daughter madeline was a baby she was little and i had you know the news ticker stock tickers on in the morning watching it and they all they didn't even know what happened the building was smoking and my little story about that was uh, i used to have a practice where i went to court you know once or twice a day and i was driving to the courthouse you know for like a nine o'clock hearing or something and I was parking, and I heard the news story that there had been a plane crash into the tower and whatnot, and I knew it was a big deal. But the courthouse was open, and I had an obligation to go make an appearance, and so I did. I went and I took care of what that, whatever that was. I didn't say anything about it to anybody because nobody, everybody was working, and they didn't know about it. I don't it. think people realized at that time that a lot of things would shut down. Yeah, so I think the courthouse did close that day, and uh, I think yeah, but stayed. after what four different sites? I mean, the yeah. the Pentagon. I mean, it was crazy. Yeah, really tragic. Uh, hopefully never repeated but uh thank goodness for the country we are because i think we have put a lot of measurements in place to make sure that we don't experience that again so you know when you fly it kind of sucks to get half naked and take off your shoes and all that jazz but you know what it's going to get you from where you are now to where you're trying to go safe i'm all about it so what do they call that uh there's that free check or pre it's called it's called oh yeah the tsa TSA pre-check that's fantastic if you, if you was, can I've been qualify. looking at that and I fly all the time, so tell me, what is it? If you can qualify for pre-check, you need to do it. It's How do you just qualify like, for that? Well, I think there's a website you can go to and ask, but if you fly enough, then your airline just sort of, you know, sends you an email and says, hey, you know, you can get on the list. And I, there was a time there where I was flying quite a bit, and uh, the pre-check is really neat. You, you don't have to take your shoes off. You don't have to take your coat off. You don't have to take the computer out of the bag. You just throw everything on the, on the belt like we used to do in the old days. And uh, you just fly right on through. It's totally stressless. It's fantastic. And the people are actually a little bit nicer, too. I don't understand what's going on there. but <laughs> Well, I guess they figure, you know, they pretty much know enough about you. Like, they don't tell us that, but I'm sure the government knows sort of what we're doing or where we're going. Yeah, hopefully the NSA or somebody does some kind of background check to make sure that, you know, you're I'm not sure. a threat. I think I fly enough. Hopefully I qualify. I'll have to check that out. Yeah, you really should. And they're, they're, I think you can apply for, for pre-check. So... So we're here with wrapping up the show here with Darren Mish, IRS Attorney Solution Show, and his website is getirshelp.com. We have another one called the IRS Solution And if listen, if you all have an event uh, that your nonprofit is sponsoring or just something cool to do in the Tampa Bay area, then by all means get in touch with me and we can promote it on the show. Sounds great. You know, because we're gonna end we're gonna end the segment every every week with just something. Something neat that you could go and experience. Sometimes for free. Sometimes it might be low cost. Sounds like a plan. So, any other uh, questions there on Twitter before we wrap up? We've got a couple minutes left, so I don't know. Let's see if we have any more. The well, call-in call number for next week, again, is 727-441-3000. 727-441-3000. I think the, the real takeaway from today's story is... Listen, tax evasion, bad. Five years, half million dollar prime. Tax avoidance, good. Tax avoidance is something that Judge Leonard Hand said is almost your obligation. That's how I take that quote. It's not just okay, it's really sort of your obligation. And if you think about this, it's your obligation to yourself and to your family to structure your affairs so that you pay as little tax as possible. I don't think that anybody, any reasonable person would really disagree with that statement so i took away from the show today your diff score i never heard that i was well that's my learner of the day i wish i i knew the formula to the diff score i think it's awesome i didn't even know that but it wouldn't make sense that's pretty cool so i mean you know little things like home office deductions those kind of stuff i'm sure are like right there not a big fan of the home office deduction let me tell you i've seen it create more audits than you can believe well it looks like we're wrapping up for this week i'm darren t mish i'm your co-host katrina madewell We'll be back here next Thursday at 1 p.m. Take care, everyone.